Welcome back to the WhitmerCast, a podcast by the John Whitmer Historical Association. We bring you essays, interviews, panel discussions, and broadcasts related to Mormon history and restoration studies. My name is Jason Smith, and today I'll be talking with Cheryl Bruno and Dr. Nick Letursky, two of the authors of the book Method Infinite, Freemasonry and the Mormon Restoration. If you would like to join JWHA or visit our entire backlog of episodes and journals, go to www.jwha.info. With that out of the way, let's get started. Hello, WhitmerCast listeners. Today we have with us Dr. Nicholas Letursky and Cheryl Bruno, two of the authors of the recently published book, Method Infinite, Freemasonry and the Mormon Restoration, put out by Greg Coford Books. Uh, Cheryl, Nick, welcome to the WhitmerCast. Hi, everyone. Uh, would you like to tell us a little bit about yourselves? Um, whoever wants to start first. Go ahead, Cheryl. Okay. Hi, I'm Cheryl Bruno, and I um, am a member of the LDS Church of Brighamites. And um, you can see that kind of in my writings a little bit. I'm very sympathetic towards Joseph Smith. Um, I raised eight children. I went, First, I went on a Mormon mission. I raised eight children, and um, they're all got, um, grown now. So I live by myself, and um, I work as the activities director in senior living community. Great. Uh, I'm Dr. Nick Letursky. I am a senior adjunct lecturer in psychology at the California Institute of Integral Studies, as well as the senior program manager for their School of Undergraduate Studies. Um, my work is in depth psychology, and that intersects with mythology, spirituality, dreams, uh, whole, whole realm of the unconscious. Uh, I am a former uh, Brighamite, uh, uh, but uh, in, in many respects, I would I I am still very fascinated with the work of Joseph Smith and the various influences and ideas that drove what he was doing. I think many of what the things that he presented were were truly beautiful. And so, you know, I, I, I'm a fan in, in a lot of ways uh, of a very imperfect uh, prophetic figure. And. Uh, I live just outside Portland, Oregon, uh, with my husband, uh, and adult stepson, and our our big uh, furry bundle of love. And uh, that's I, I have uh, four. I also have four adult children, daughters, and one granddaughter. Okay. Um, the The book came out, uh, I guess, in August of twenty two. Right? It's not not that long ago. And it's uh, it's gotten a lot of good reviews. Um, I wrote one of them uh, for disclaimer purposes, and I'm, I'm a big fan of the book. Can you tell us uh, how this project got started? I, kn I know a little bit about it. I've heard about it for years, as most people have that are familiar with the book, and uh, it's long awaited. But uh, tell us a little bit about the birthing process of this book. So as a, a zealous member <laughs> of the LDS Church, um, living in Nauvoo, um, I ended up finally following through with a really a lifetime fascination with Freemasonry. I, I had been interested from the time I was a young child passing by the Masonic Temple in our in my hometown. And I really decided it was time. And I had spent many, many years studying LDS church history and doctrines. And so when I began to receive my initiations in Freemasonry, I just kept hearing Joseph over and over again. Not to say that Joseph was quoting the rituals, but the ideas, the concepts, and realizing how much of his preaching was influenced by what I was experiencing in those rituals. And honestly, as, as kind of a zealous believer at the time, I, I started out with a naive idea that, oh, maybe this was all a a prophecy of Joseph Smith, you know, encoded in, in these things passed down. That's no longer my conclusion, but, you know, that's kind of where I started. And so I began to really dig into this. And you know, I, I knew that 
the, the works that had already been done were either done by Mormons who really didn't know Freemasonry or Masons who really didn't know Mormonism. And I wanted to bring both of those things together. And as I started traveling and going through the original primary sources, I started finding where, honestly, um, a number of Latter-day Saint authors in particular had either misquoted original sources or simply didn't understand what they were reading. And so they, they were missing cues and ideas that, that, a, that an experienced Freemason would, would know. Uh, so even you know, going in the record book uh, in Quincy, Illinois, uh, for Bodley Lodge, which had a lot of interactions with Nauvoo, there were things in that original record book that really raised flags of what was going on in Nauvoo that we hadn't known before. So as I began doing all this research over the course of about four years initially, um, I traveled, corresponded, had a chance to get into, you know, lodge records and uh, ranging from uh, Utah, well, California, actually, uh, got down to Arkansas, in the area where the Mountain Meadows uh, wagons came from. And several of them were in the lodges down there. I was able to get into original records in many cases that had been boxed up and stored in the back of closets for decades. And I began to piece this together. There came a time um, when I did, uh, you know, personally come out, come out of the closet and left the LDS church. And so I kind of went into a time of rebuilding my life. And so that's where I, I ended up having to step back a little bit from the project. And I hand, handed uh, my materials over to Joe Steve Swick. Uh, who is also a brilliant uh, Latter-day Saint and an experienced Freemason. And, uh, you know, continued to work with Joe and talk with Joe and, and discuss all the evidence that had been found. And things went on from there. And that's this, this is where Cheryl picks up. That's the way I come in. Um, the reason Joe isn't with us today is that he is in a skilled nursing facility after having... Um, undergone a couple of strokes. So we sure miss Joe a lot. Um, and when when Nick handed over their research to Joe, it was voluminous. It was uh, many books, articles, um, things that he had found, as he said, in, in dusty closets and just an amazing collection. And um, Joe was trying to um, sort and organize these things, and he brought me on to the project to kind of organize the collection. And when I started, um, when I got my hands into it, now my interest is esotericism and Mormonism, and so I'm very fascinated with Freemasonry and the influence it had on Joseph Smith. So when I started going through this collection, I thought that, oh, we need to just start writing <laughs> right away even before we had it completely organized. And I don't think it ever did get completely organized. It's still kind of in a little bit of a chaos. But um, but we started writing right away and um, I was just thrilled. Joe and I would go to a little coffee shop across the street from our house and we'd spend hours and hours there uh, just going over the materials and putting it all together. And um, then after Joe had, um, after Joe entered the, um, the community that he's in right now, I really started working in earnest on writing down the, um, putting the chapters together and also had the help of um, Nick came back into the project as a consultant. And we had several other people, Patrick McCleary and you, Jason, um, and uh, who else, Nick, was was in our little um, chat group. Clinton Bartholomew. Uh... Oh, right, Clinton, of course. And, um, yeah, we had several uh, Freemasons, so I could, since Joe wasn't right there for me to ask, I could then say, well, you know, if because I'm not a Freemason myself, I could um, get their collective um, expertise on what I was writing down. And so I feel really fortunate to have all of that um, at my disposal because, like Nick said, um, we haven't had um, a real good presentation of Mormonism and Freemasonry from someone who was on the inside and also from the inside of Mormonism and Freemasonry as well. 
So I think that's really what our book brings to the table. In my review, I, I talked a little bit about the uh, McGavin and, and uh, you know, the two books, Mormon, Mormonism and Masonry, that came out. And those were kind of the standard go-tos for many years. And then Homer's book came out. You two have have come out and and really put together a, a, a great uh, piece of work. And I think your your main thesis, if, if one of you wants to to kind of summarize that, I, I think is 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 stellar. I think it's what makes the book stand out. If you could kind of summarize your main uh, the the main thesis about Joseph and and, and masonry in in just a couple of sentences, Nick. <laughs> <laughs> was that a reminder to keep it short okay <laughs> in a couple I, if, if i were to give you know the quick elevator speech it is that joseph came from a time and place where he understood that there would be a future restoration of both christianity and freemasonry bringing both their pure form and bringing them together and he in his uh, experiences and inspiration came to believe he was the person to do that. And as he proceeded to develop what became Mormonism, both of those traditions became highly, highly influential. And also, as Nick always says, Joseph Smith was involved with Freemasonry from the cradle to the grave. So that's what our book covers, right? From um, before Joseph Smith even came on the scene with the Smith to um, the uh, martyrdom and beyond, we we cover how Freemasonry was influential in the rise of Mormonism. Yeah, you you really do a good job, you know, setting things up with with Morgan and and the kind of the 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 Masonic world that Joseph was born into, especially in that in that that region. What are some of the uh, the more surprising things, the revelations that uh, you discovered along the way in your research? Oh my goodness. <laughs> um, so many things were revelations to me. Um, I was new to, I I saw Freemasonry and Mormonism early on, but I was new to really digging into it and also new to seeing just how much it affected Joseph Smith early in his life. And in his discovery of the Book of Mormon, even in his first vision, those things were really fascinating to me as I as I saw the influence that they had, not just when he got to Nauvoo and joined the lodge, but so much earlier. And, you know, there were sort of intimations of that, but to me it was so surprising just to see how much it affected him. I think for me, some of the, the biggest surprises, one of the first things was realizing how involved Joseph really was in Nauvoo Lodge. You know, up, in, up until the research that that we did. McGavin, Ken Godfrey, others had made it really a point of saying, oh, Joseph only attended his own initiations and, and a couple other meetings, and he was too busy to be involved any more than that. And, and, you know, kind of this effort to distance him from the lodge. And once getting into the lodge records, as well as Joseph's own history, and, you know, even the published history of the LDS church, finding out that he was intimately involved in the workings of the Lodge on an ongoing basis. Also finding out just how flagrant, honestly, Nauvoo Lodge was uh, in doing their own thing. You know, finding in, finding in the records of Bodley Lodge that Nauvoo Lodge was sending them messages in Royal Arch Cipher, which is really kind of a, a social faux pas at best. Because, you know, this is two Blue Lodges communicating, not Royal Arch chapters. And finding out, you know, that Joseph actually envisioned a Mormon Grand Lodge. That that was actually his goal as we saw the proliferation of Freemasonry among the Latter-day Saints of, of the time. I think one, one of the other big surprises, and I'll kind of stop there and not get too long, would be, you know, getting into the records uh, of the lodges down in Arkansas and finding how many uh, Freemasons, frankly, were involved with the uh, murder of Parley P. Pratt. Uh, um, you know, it, the judge in, in the trial that where, where Parley was arrested on, uh, you know, kind of trumped up charges, several of the people involved in that entire story were members of the local lodge. And, and so it's been a lot of surprises like that as we've gone through. Have there been, I assume, some lodges that weren't open to, uh, to sharing their records, or did you not find that? I never came across that, honestly. You know, I I think I think being a Freemason was very instrumental. Yeah. In that. And and 
it's really funny, you know, one of the lodges that I went to not only dug into the back of the closet and got out this old orange crate that was taped up in a whole bunch of duct tape and dug that out and opened it for me to get into the old records. But it was actually sort of funny because when I left, he he basically insisted on giving me a tessellated floor carpet that the lodge had that they were no longer using. Wow. And, and so, you know, I was traveling by car, so I ended up taking this tessellated floor home. <laughs> <laughs> but Jason also the the problem wasn't no so much that it was just that so many of the records are missing we have you know fires that burnt many of the records and so and also even records that we know existed for a while are no longer there mysteriously taken away by who knows who um so that was frustrating Especially when we know they did, there were records, the, the Masons kept very good records. And so we know that there were records there, and then they're no longer available for us to peruse. And so that was very frustrating. Yeah, that, that's an excellent point. I mean, you know, the, the original early law, early records in Utah, for example, have gone missing. They, they were borrowed between Grand Lodges for centenary celebrations, and then just seem to have evaporated. And so we know there had to have been records from um, the other Nauvoo Lodges as well. So um, where are they? We don't know where they are, and it would be so helpful to be able to look at those. Somebody's got an attic somewhere. <laughs> yeah, it, Masons normally do keep really good records. Yeah. As a, as a former lodge secretary, I can attest to that. My my home lodge was chartered in 1893, so it doesn't go back nearly as far as is the period you're talking about. But it's it's burned down twice, yeah. yeah. And so anytime the record is found, it's it's seen as is uh, sacred and 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 protect protected as well as well it can as can be, because it's all we have. So the the, the fact that you're able to find records back that far is amazing to me, and and uh, I'm a little envious of being able to do that in, in some cases you know there really is a kind of a clear case of intentional hiding of the records uh, warsaw lodge for example you know had a record from that time um, i i knew of people who were intimately involved with on you know the ongoing warsaw lodge and had seen those records and were able to tell me well they were in this person's custody and then they went to this person and Finally, the trail ends uh, with a small house that's built right on the Mississippi River as you drive between Warsaw and Nauvoo. And, and if you drive by there, you, you look at this house and you say, why would anybody build this house? Because it's on the river side of the highway uh, and, and you know it's prone to, to flooding. And there was a major flood just a few years before. And then you know, somehow the records evaporate at that point. Hmm. Yeah, perhaps they were lost in the flood, perhaps not. But you know, I had contact even with with people in Warsaw and Carthage who had seen those original records and knew that they had information that would have been useful to our story. So, as historians, uh, we love records and we see the value of saving and preserving those records. But not everybody thinks things are important. And I have a little story that just happened to me this week about a project that I'm working on right now, which I'm writing a biography of William Marks. And I was looking for the provenance of a certain letter that William Marks had written to Josiah Butterfield and um, Hiram Falk. And uh, the Community of Christ Library Archives were helping me determine that provenance. And Rachel Killebrew was able to find me how that came into their collection. And it was Josiah Butterfield's son and he wrote a little letter, we have the letter, and it said that he and his mother, as when his father passed away, he and his mother were looking through um, his effects, and they found a bundles of letters from William Marks, and they burned them, and they just saved the one letter, um, oh. and they burned all the rest of them, because they didn't, I guess they just didn't see the importance of it, and it just makes me ill. <laughs> Yeah. To think that we had all this information 
this, these letters from William Marx, and we know that in his letters he talked about his feelings about the church, and he talked about so many things that about the early church that would have been so valuable to have, and um, they were just burned, and we have no idea um, what was in them. So that's as a historian, it just it it just makes you just feel so frustrated, but. Um, Many people don't see the importance of these records. And so if they have them in their possession, they don't care for them and they, they can be destroyed and damaged and lost to us. That makes me sad too. The, <laughs> the motivation, you talked a little about this earlier, Nick, the, the experiences you had as you know, becoming initiated as a Freemason and you started seeing connections, but what, and, and Cheryl, you, you mentioned your just general interest in, in the Mormon esotericism. What what is your motivation? Uh, if you could if you could kind of describe that a little bit, what what keeps you going into uh, such uh, what some people would would might seem as obscure corners to dig you know to keep digging? Well, I can start. Um, so to me, I really do love the the um, Brighamite Church, um, which I'm involved in, but I do see a change in it since the early days, and I. I feel that I don't want the, just the, what word can I use to say that it seems like the early church had just such a vitality that's missing today. And this esotericism gave it the vitality that it had. And so I want people to see this and to know what it was like in the early church, what it was like to be taught by Joseph Smith and what the meaning of some of his um, messages were. Because like Nick said, um, as with Freemason eyes, with Masonic eyes, you can look at some of these sermons and you can see where what he's getting at and um, just a larger meaning behind these things. If you look at the esoteric meaning, which is hidden, right? It's, um, it's hidden for a reason, but to be able to bring that out a little bit to modern Mormons, I think is really valuable. So I think that was one of my motivations to be able to let people see the the value of the these early esoteric movements in the church. You know, as as we were as I was doing research, I came across uh, Franklin D. Richards' journals and, and talking about a visit that he made years later to Nauvoo. Uh, and at that time, the Masonic Hall in Nauvoo had become private residence, and the owners took off the entire third floor, which is where which had been the lodge room. And and it just happened to be that he arrived, you know, at the time they were doing this renovation. And he remarked seeing the pillars, Jacob and Boaz, on the wood pile outside, ready to be burned. And that was such an evocative image to me. Uh, and, and as it happens, you know, we we sort of open and close the book with with that image. For me, there is such a rich, deep, esoteric aspect to what Joseph was doing. Uh, there, there is there is so much meaning and depth there, and that's a legacy that has been largely jettisoned uh, in modern times. Uh, the LDS Church, in particular, has really tried to distance itself from those things in in many ways. And so, for me, this book is a love letter to Mormonism, and and that sounds strange for some coming from somebody who's no longer a Latter Day Saint, but. It really is saying, look, here is something beautiful and valuable in your past, in your history. It's there for you to reclaim if you want to. So, so that's what sort of drive that's that's what really ended up driving me. Hmm. So I'd like to go off on a soapbox for a minute here, too, um, um, because we see lately that um, so many people are involved in uh, the Joseph Never Lived Polygamy movement. And what they've done, and I'm not going to comment on that aspect, but what they've done is they've brought Freemasonry into their, their research or their efforts. And what they want to do is they want to present Freemasonry as something evil, something dark, something scary. It's something that Joseph Smith was never involved with that it was Brigham Young or Heber C. Kimball who were the motivations behind the, the Masonic lodges in Nauvoo. And so I feel like this actually just hurts their cause 
to take masonry and give it this this meaning. And I think that our book is becoming more and more valuable as this movement gains impetus because you can look at our book and see just the the evidence that Joseph Smith was involved, the evidence that Joseph Smith was a Freemason. And you can also see the beauty of masonry, not as a scary, dark, evil thing, but some of the beauties that Joseph saw in it, we like to present in our chapters. I think we show them quite well, some of the, some of the things that jo Joseph was drawn to. Why was Joseph involved in Freemasonry? We we answer that question, and we and we show just what he why he would have been so so drawn to Freemasonry. Yeah, it's amazing. You know, the um, when I was talking with Bill Russell yesterday, he he mentioned Richard Price. You know, an RLDS restorationist that published a book. You know, Joseph fought polygamy, and it's, it's amazing that so many of those arguments are are getting resurrected today after seems like they were have all been de debunked already and i guess some some conspiracy theories never die so uh, i would like to to ask you both if you could give a story or two or or three we, we have plenty of time of maybe your favorite thing that you found out that you came across your favorite your favorite story to tell in the book i know why <laughs> i want nick to tell because it's like one of my favorites too and and we both love this story. Go ahead, Nick. Start us <laughs> off. She's predicting. <laughs> uh, so for me, the the one discovery that just completely lit me on fire was finding the meeting uh, and and the original diary record talking about Joseph Smith coming into lodge one night uh, late after the meeting started. And that he was allowed to enter, and he the the, the letter says that he, or excuse me, the journal rather says that he he strode up and down the aisle through the middle of the lodge, saying Hallelujah, Hallelujah, Hallelujah! I have finally done what King Solomon, King Hiram of Tyre, and Hiram of If could not do. I have, and it goes on to say that he's laid the foundations for Mormonism to continue beyond him. If you read it for, if, and if you read it with a Masonic understanding, what he believes he has done at that point is restored and passed on the lost word, which of course is very central to Masonic ritual. That in and of itself is an encapsulation of what Joseph was doing. And this is shortly before his death. But it's that moment when he says, look, I have done what didn't happen in the Legends of Solomon's Temple. But now it's done. Now the word has been passed on. And will continue to survive. Finding that letter for me was the capstone, if you will. Maybe the keystone, I should say. Uh, for, you know, Speaking Masonically. Of everything joseph had done everything joseph was trying to do in terms of freemasonry here it was here was the fulfillment of what he had been trained all his life to accomplish i don't know if that's the, i don't know if that's the uh the highlight that cheryl was expecting me to talk yes about. <laughs> absolutely yes i knew you were going to say that and i just <laughs> I feel like that um, one of the questions our book does answer that other books on Masonry and Mormonism did not answer was what was Joseph Smith doing with Freemasonry? And that is one of the huge, that's one of the things that shows us so clearly what he was doing. And there were other, there were other purposes he had as well, which we also talk about in the book, but that was one of the real big ones. So I love that story. So for me, one of my aha moments was um, in researching some of the movements that followed um, the martyrdom. So one of the ones I researched quite deeply was James Strang. And one of my great researching James Strang with the Masonic look, because he was also involved in Masonry, and he wrote a diary 
some coded um, places in his diary, which I think his son or grandson later translated by just using a substitution method. But when I looked at the diary and I saw the actual coded portions, I recognized it as a Royal Arch Cipher. It was very um, changed because instead of the um, hard edges, like the little, what what do you call those? Like the right angles, the angles, he used curves instead of the angles. So not it, it, it wasn't real noticeable to anyone <clears throat> that it was a Royal Arch Cipher. But as I noticed the curves going the different ways and the U instead of the, you know, square, it was really fascinating. And I was able to recognize that it was a Royal Arch Cipher that was used by James Strang. And he used this also in some letters that he wrote. So that was really fascinating to me to find just little things like this are really just so much fun. Those are great. You you both were, were talking earlier about the Masonic world that, that Joseph was was born into. Can you can you tell us a little bit about maybe just a, a briefly about about the Morgan affair and, and the anti-Masonic worldview? Because I know that, you know, some some critics, they take issue with your your conclusion that the, the Book of Mormon is Masonic. If you want to address that at all, that I would love I would love to give you a chance to do that. So the Morgan Affair, just for those who are unfamiliar, you know, Freemasonry obviously has obligations made by candidates not to reveal things that they've been taught in in the initiations. And William Morgan was a, a gentleman who came to upstate New York. Uh, he was a bricklayer by profession and really sort of a troubled individual in, in many respects. Um, he had a young wife, uh, you know, quite a bit younger than him, Lucinda, and he had uh, some alcohol problems and other problems. He was known to have some difficulty supporting his young family as, as he tried to work in the area. He claimed to be a Freemason. Uh, claimed that he'd been initiated uh, before he came to that area. There is no evidence to be certain one way or the other uh, whether he was. But he attempted to join the Royal Arch Chapter there in New York, and they actually refused him. Uh, they refused his petition. And this angered him so badly that he decided that he would write an expose. And before that time, there had been a number of exposés uh, of the Blue Lodge degrees. There had not been an expose of the Royal Arch degrees. And he made it known that his project would be to find out those degree workings and publish them as well. And so as he began his work, uh, he had he ended up writing down the Blue Lodge degrees and, as far as we know, never finished uh, his work on the Royal Arch degrees. But a group of Freemasons in Ontario Lodge, which was the lodge in Canandaigua, really took the took some of the symbolic representations in Freemasonry uh, that are meant to show the seriousness of your obligations. Uh, they took those um, quite literally. And basically a conspiracy was formed in a lodge meeting to stop William Morgan from publishing his expose. And this is the lodge that Joseph Smith Sr. was almost certainly a member of. Uh, whether he was present for those meetings or not, we don't know. But uh, we do have certainly testimony that the plan was hatched there. William Morgan was arrested by uh, the local authorities after somebody from the lodge claimed that he had a debt for them, a very small debt. He was able to make arrangements to take care of that, and somebody else promptly came forward and claimed he owed a debt to them. They then bailed him out, brought him into a carriage, and took him away with him yelling, murder, murder. And that was the last that was seen of William Morgan. Uh, and there are many stories of what may have happened. Most likely, he was taken up uh, in, into Canada, into, into Fort Niagara, but beyond that, uh, he may have been murdered. Uh, he may have been paid to go elsewhere and remain silent. That, that's one of the stories. 
but the most honestly the most likely is is that he uh, he was killed in the process of this this spurred a tremendous social and political backlash at the time uh, and created the anti-masonic movement that movement became so prominent that uh, it, be it launched america's first third party presidential candidate even but the anti-masonic movement became extremely popular especially there in upstate new york where this all happened people were actually you know acting out masonic rituals in public on the street uh, as part of these exposés that were being put out, people were discussing. It was a hot topic. You could not exist in that area around Palmyra and Batavia, New York, without knowing about Freemasonry, because it became such an um, over-discussed issue. Uh, there is at least one person that suggests that uh, William Morgan, during a short term that that he sort of went on hiatus and disappeared, may have visited the Smith family, but we were unable to prove that uh, allegation. What's interesting is that, of course, Joseph later ends up uh, taking one of William Morgan's widow as one of his plural wives, Lucinda Morgan. So this is the world that Joseph comes out of, is this hotbed of anti-Masonic activity. And yet... He has already been trained and been growing in a family that is Masonic, a family that takes the legends of Freemasonry as, his, as history, and a family that is interested in discovering what has been lost. And so he is in that situation of understanding that there's a tradition of true Freemasonry versus spurious Freemasonry. And what what has come about with the Morgan affair is a corruption or spurious Freemasonry. And Joseph's seeing at this early stage that, that at some point this needs to be restored and reformed. I, I hope that answers your question. Yeah, um, you, you, you mentioned, uh, you know, kind of authentic and spurious Masonry. You know, the, the, there's been a, a charge for, for many years, even Martin Harris, you know, called you know, the Book of Mormon, the anti-Masonic book. And there are, you know, you, there are people today that um, that still think the Book of Mormon is anti-Masonic. And maybe you could speak to that a little bit, because I know that that, that is um, still widely held by a lot of historians. So uh, I'll address that one. Um, so especially Dan Vogel, <laughs> let's mention names, <laughs> um, talks about the Book of Shout Mormon. Shout Dan. <laughs> Hi, Dan. Um, we, he talks about the Book of Mormon as being anti-Masonic. And um, he's also gained a following for that. And he's not the only one. Um, and we see in the Book of Mormon things like people, like like the groups of people that have oaths, um, bloody oaths, and... and um, so um, you can see the Book of Mormon as being anti-Masonic. However, if you have the view that we do, that, that Joseph Smith saw um, the masonry of the day as being spurious masonry, or maybe like an apostate form of, of masonry, most Mormons will understand this because we understand that a Christianity was, um, had gone into kind of an apostasy and he was restoring this. And so if you understand that Joseph Smith saw um, masonry of the day as a, a corrupted form of masonry and that he was going to restore the true masonry, then we can see this in the Book of Mormon, that there is a corrupt form of um, these things and that also he believes that there's a true form because you have Nephi building a temple, which is a very Masonic-like temple. If you if you um, read one of our chapters, it will show you how that was that was Masonic. And you see a lot of things in the Book of Mormon that present Masonry in a, a um, positive light, as well as a negative light. So you, you can see the spurious and the true Freemasonry in the Book of Mormon. And so since you can see that, um, I don't believe it should be called an anti-Masonic book. 
Although there is um, places, there are places in the book where we do present um, Masonic um, elements as being corrupt. This is the this is the spurious masonry that we see there, and then we also see true masonry as well. Yeah, and that's a theme that continues through Joseph's work. I mean, you see it in the Book of Abraham, for example. The whole concept of, of Pharaoh having a corrupted or inauthentic priesthood versus versus the true form. That That is something that continues through Joseph's ministry. One of the things that you mentioned about uh, Joseph Smith Sr. probably being a member of Ontario Lodge, and you've received some pushback on that too. Maybe you want to address that, the evidence for, for Joseph Smith Sr. being a Mason and, and being a member of that lodge. Uh, I can start talking about it and then Nick can jump in. <laughs> um, but uh, we don't have a proof positive that Joseph Smith Sr. was um, a member of the lodge. We we do have proof positive that like Hiram Smith was a member of the lodge or that Joseph Smith was but um, we do not have an actual written record that shows Joseph Smith Sr. as being a member of the lodge. But we do have um, certain, we have, both of us agree that that in all probability he was a member of the lodge. And we have several reasons for believing um, these things. Just the amount of time that when he, uh, the amount of time that passed when he was in a certain area, you know, aligns with when he would have been able to apply for the lodge and there are many different aspects that that show that he was probably a member of the lodge um but we don't want to we don't want to say that we have certain proof right fair enough yeah, I mean, there is there is absolutely a written record of a joseph smith entering yes yes Ariel lodge and yes the debate, if you will, is whether that Joseph Smith is Joseph Smith Sr., because there are other individuals named Joseph Smith in, in the region. Um, but as Cheryl said, it, it's a matter of putting together the timing and such. And, and we're careful in the book to state that this is most likely not absolute proof. Mm -hmm. But you know, looking at the history, if you go back in the original records of the Grand Lodge of Vermont, you find out that Joseph Smith Sr. tried to join Federal Lodge 15 in Randolph, Vermont, uh, which is a lodge that other Smith family members were part of. And he was blackballed. He, he was denied initiation in that lodge. Uh, that may be because, you know, he apparently had some alcohol issues uh, earlier on. Uh, may also be, be in part... Uh, due to conflicts he had with local merchants. But in any event, he was refused. And under the bylaws in Vermont, he could not you know, go and try to join another lodge in Vermont. So it's not until Palmyra, until he moves to New York, that you see that effort being made again. And the timing works, frankly, for Joseph Smith Sr.'s move to Palmyra. You know, the immediate question there is, well, why didn't he join Mount Moriah Lodge, which is actually in Palmyra? But, you know, the reality is Canandaigua was where things were happening at the time. That was the center of economic and social activity. And so as a newcomer to that area, he very well may have wanted to build relationships uh, you know, in, in the center of where things were happening. We do have evidence that there were people in in Ontario Lodge who lived closer to other lodges. Mm -hmm. So it's not just a matter of joining the lodge closest to you at the time. There are other other factors can come into the question of where somebody joined. But it's it's very clear in any event that Joseph Smith Sr. was aware of the legends of Freemasonry and took them very seriously. And and we discuss this in the book. We discuss what he was exposed to and and what he frankly just swallowed whole and, and and became part of his own spiritual beliefs and practices and so in all likelihood he is the joseph smith that joined ontario lodge but we're careful in the book to state that that is not an absolute truth and i would say that's an area that i take issue with some critics 
uh, because some critics of the book have not recognized where we're careful to say this is a most likely situation, not a proven situation. Instead, they say, oh, well, they can't prove this. Well, we've said it's not proven. We've explained what, what the evidence you know, directs us to believe. That's a good point. There, there are some places in the book where, uh, as you read it, you're like, come on, just, you know, be a little more definitive here. Say, you know, say it yes or no. And, uh, and you are very careful as, uh, as far as scholarship goes, that's, that's good. As a, as a reader, sometimes you, you wish that you pushed it just a little further, but we want to be accurate. So are there things in the book that we didn't cover that you really feel like, uh, our listeners need to know about here's, here's your chance to, to pitch the book. You know, it, it's interesting. Over the last year, the book has been nominated for a number of awards. And I had an encounter with an individual who was a, a committee member on one of the awards. And I was really struck with his comment to me. Um, he, he said that, you know, as they were considering it, he says, yeah, I really enjoyed looking back at the, all those old arguments. And, and I, I, I bit my tongue and, and kind of smiled and nodded. Uh, what I almost wish I would have said is you obviously didn't read the book uh, because it's the book is not the old arguments. The book is has a huge amount of new evidence that either had never been examined or had been examined improperly. And, and as I said, in many cases, misquoted. You mentioned McGavin. McGavin misquotes bodily lodge records, for example, uh, blatantly. Because he's taking Bali Lodge's actions as anti-Mormon, as opposed to following established Masonic procedure. And, and he outright misquotes them. The, the book is not just a rehash of old arguments. The book is bringing forth new evidence, new eyes, a new perspective that has never been brought. We're both fully involved Freemasons and fully involved Mormons are able to bring both cultures together with, with open eyes. This is what the book offers that has never been offered before. And, and so I, you know, when, when that award uh, committee member said that to me, I, I, I wish I would have. <laughs> it, it, was, it was certainly well after any decisions have been made, but I wish I had come back to him and said, wait a minute, you know, y you miss the entire thrust of the book, if that's what you think it was. Cheryl? Yeah, I think the book also just presents a view of Joseph Smith. It's almost like a Joseph Smith biography in a way, because it does um, consider his entire life. And it presents a view of Joseph Smith that no other biography had. And so I think it's really valuable in church history to read this book, uh, whether you're interested in masonry or not. If you're interested in Joseph Smith or church history, you owe it to yourself to look at this uh, view of him. And I know that John Turner is writing a book, a biography of Joseph Smith right now, and he's consulting our book too, which made me very happy. And it was actually just a huge compliment that he knew who I was. Um, but I think that that says something about him is that he's willing to look at these different aspects of Joseph Smith's life and um, consider them as he's writing biography. So I think that's important. It's important for historians and it's important just for anyone that's interested in church history or Joseph Smith to see this, this view of him. And we go from everything from the, what I like about the book, we go from everyone, everything from the broad picture of Mormonism, the broad picture of Joseph Smith, to little tiny details that haven't been fully considered yet. One of the little details that I thought was, was interesting about our book that isn't in any of the other books is when John C. Bennett was kicked out of Nauvoo Lodge, they thought that he, one of the reasons why he had to be removed from the lodge was because they said that he'd been kicked out of another lodge. And when we went back to the records, we found this little detail that he was not kicked out of that lodge, he demitted from that lodge. Mm. And so it just shows that he was kind of, John C. Bennett was kind of given a raw deal there, in a way, you know? I mean, there were many things that he did that were scandalous, but that particular thing that they said 
um, had happened, he was right. He was not kicked out of that lodge. And he was telling the truth in that one little aspect. So um, that's just a little detail among many that we bring out that hasn't been talked about before by any other of the, by, of the masonry, masonry books. I think Cheryl says that so well when she says that this is, you know, in part a a, a biography of Joseph, uh, of a piece of his life that's not been explored. It's interesting to me as, as somebody who is no longer a Latter-day Saint. And, and of course, I anticipated that there would be some pushback to the book uh, because there is a tradition within Mormonism sometimes to, you know, shoot the messenger <laughs> and not consider the, the work itself. And to me... Even as somebody who is no longer a practicing Mormon, this is a story of an amazing, brilliant spiritual figure. Whether or not Joseph was inspired, he was at the very least a religious and ritual genius. And to me, this book brings a great respect to Joseph, regardless of where you're coming from. There's nothing in this book that is faith destroying, because what you know, that's part of what's interesting to me is. You can see, reading this book, the hand of God, if you will, guiding Joseph through this process. You can absolutely see that from, from a faithful perspective. You can also have a non-faith perspective and, and see something more earthbound, if you will. It's about a fascinating story of an amazing figure. It's not a religious argument, if you will. But it, it is telling a story that is important and vital and still influential in the world today. Yeah, Nick has really hit upon the points and the reason why everyone should read the book, because <clears throat> it's um, people of faith might be a little bit afraid to delve into the Masonic aspect of Mormonism. But this is presented from a faithful perspective where, as Nick said, you can see Joseph Smith as being a religious figure guided by God, but also the same, same way for people who believe differently about Joseph Smith is there's just fascinating information that they can get glean from the book that um, is not anywhere else that um, they will be interested in. So yeah, everyone, everyone will love this book, I think. <laughs> It's it's kind of daunting. It, it's kind of daunting to think about reading the book, but from the first chapter, I think it really will engross you because there are just so many interesting aspects of Joseph Smith's life that are not found anywhere else. It it is engrossing. When I when I got uh, my copy to do the review, I think I read it in in a couple of days, which was meant, meant a lot of other things in my life set aside to, to finish that because I couldn't wait to find out what was next. You both did a great job, all three of you. One, one question I like to ask near the end of the interview is if, um, if you had some way to go back in time and, and give yourself some advice when you started this, this project, what would that be? <laughs> one thing for me would be to keep your mouth shut a little bit about your research <laughs> because it, was interesting to see things that I had shared with other scholars get published before uh, we had a chance to publish them. Another would be, as, as Cheryl alluded to earlier, get writing faster. When, when I turned materials over to Joe, I had written a little over 100 pages of manuscript. And, you know, in retrospect, you know, what, what Cheryl sa said earlier would have been a better, tr a better turn of events. If instead of being, I'm, I'm the person who can get lost in an archive for hours. And in retrospect, you know, I, I wish I would have been actively writing the manuscript much faster and earlier. As it turned out, you know, this was a very long birthing process. Mm -hmm. One that would probably not have come to fruition if not for Cheryl's amazing work. And, uh, you know, it, it could have come forward earlier. It could have been an easier labor. <laughs> well, I really, um, I'm glad I had the opportunity. I'm glad you didn't write it all before I came on the scene. But um, I, I do feel like that was my, um, my contribution really was 
to get it in writing because I think Joe, if Joe had had it, for, he would have had it for another 10 or 15 years before he ever got to writing because he had so many ideas. And I'm glad we actually just started the writing when we did because I was able to get so, um, so many of Joe's ideas into the book. Although I do feel kind of sad because I think there are many, many things that were in his mind that he wanted to include in the book that never got there because he was never able to to put them down or even to talk um, to me about them. Or there were also some things he did talk to me about and to Nick about that we kind of just don't really remember clearly that, you know, that he had in his mind in a certain way that he was never able to express. So, yeah, in a way, it's sad that that those things didn't come out. But in a way, it's really also good that I was able to um, pull those out of him and get them down in writing before. And we never know what's going to happen, right, to us. <laughs> we never know how long we have on this earth. So um, I'm glad that we were able to get it done when we did. Yeah, I, I really, I, I dearly miss Joe's, uh, you know, active friendship. You know, we, we were friends for many, many years. And these kind of conversations like we're having today would have been so enriched. Yeah. Oh, yeah. He was able to be here with us and and helping to carry the ideas forward. So Yes. And neither one of us would have gotten a word in edgewise. <laughs> he would have taken all the air time and he would have been fascinating. Well, is there anything else that, that you want to say that I that I didn't ask about one fun bit about the book to me um, interestingly enough the book has drawn some interest from uh, Mormon fundamentalist groups who've been deeply interested in the history and, and it's been received really well in those quarters which which is kind of exciting to me honestly uh, and and a huge surprise and in part because of that interest you know the hardback sold out very quickly the book is, you know, available in paperback now. Rumor has it uh, that a leather edition will be coming out uh, in the near future. We don't have an exact date, uh, but you know, we were told the first quarter of 2024. We'll we'll see how that plays out. But uh, yeah, it, it's it is still there, still available, and I encourage people to to pick it up and read it. Yeah, I just want to talk a little bit about um, going forward, like because I think you, your readers might be interested in the projects that both Nick and I are involved in that are going to be coming out soon. So I'll let you, Nick. You just stole my next question, Cheryl. Oh, oh. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Okay. There we go. Okay, so I am writing a biography of William Marks with John Dinger. And this will be coming out in probably just a few months. It's in the publication process right now. And like I alluded to earlier, there's a lot of really fun little stories about that book. And I think people will be, some people will say, oh, who was William Marks? They don't even know who he is. And he is a figure in Mormonism that deserves to be known. So I think this will be a great biography. And then there's also another project that I am editing a compilation of articles on early Mormon polygamy. And that will also be coming out this year. It's with signature books. And it has some great, um, some of the big names in Mormon polygamy, Don Bradley and Todd Compton and Susan Staker. A lot of people have written articles for that book. And so that'll be an interesting one to, to look for. I, I especially can't wait to see the book on William Marks. I, I think that is hugely important. And Cheryl, I'm, I'm really excited to see that coming forward for you. Absolutely. Um, for myself, um, you know, I mentioned earlier that I'm in, in some ways a, uh, you know, pre-Brighamite Josephite. <laughs> Josephite maybe is the wrong word because that became, uh, you know, a word typically used in, in the RLDS uh, and Community of Christ uh, movement early on but you know my interest really is in what gave rise to joseph what formed who he was and, and freemasonry is obviously a part of that i am currently working on another book slowly that could almost be considered a sequel uh, to method infinite 
those who are familiar with Masonic history know that there's actually a crossover between Freemasonry and ceremonial magic. And particularly in that time period, there was a lot of interest interweaving these things. Oddly enough, one of our critics ha has said, you know, Masonry had nothing to do with magic. And that was just bizarre uh, to make such a claim. The reality is there is a lot of crossover and Joseph was a ceremonial magician. That, that is simply a, a statement of fact. D. Michael Quinn obviously wrote early Mormonism and the magic worldview, but that's you know a few decades old now. And there's more evidence available. And again, we have a situation where, you know, magicians have written without understanding Mormonism and Mormons have written without understanding magic and, and missed things. And so I am currently working uh, toward a book on, you know, specifically on Joseph as a magician and, and how that influenced his, his ongoing ministry. Um, I am also under contract with Rutledge right now uh, to do a work on uh, a book on the work on ceremonial magic as it appears in the work of Carl Jung. Hmm. And, and so that will be uh, probably coming out sooner than the Joseph book. But those are my active projects right now that I'm excited about and, and moving forward with. These are all exciting projects. I look forward to them. Uh, it, where can people get a hold of you if they want to contact you? I love talking to people about all aspects of church history. I'm on Facebook. Um, so, yeah, I don't I don't always friend people. I like to friend people that I actually know in person. But um, but um, if you write me a message, I always respond. And sometimes that grows into more. Um, and so that's um, one way that you can contact me. I, I'm also on Facebook. Um... And then you can also find me at my website. It's at dancingancestors.com. Uh, part of my work, I, I am a professionally trained spiritual guide, uh, working with people who want to explore and deepen their own relationship with the divine, uh, whatever that looks like for them. And so Dancing Ancestors is sort of my uh, portal for that work with my clients. But it, you can also reach me through that. Okay. Well, Nick, Cheryl, thank you so oh, much. I have one more thing, oh. Jason. Oh, one I have more one more thing. I have one more thing. I have something written on the book cover in Royal Arch Cipher. And so we encourage everybody to try to decipher the Royal Arch Cipher that's on there. And that's I just think that's a fun little thing that we have going on. And I think, Nick, I've only heard of one person that deciphered it. Have you I, heard of more? I have. Oh, good, good. <laughs> it, it's a handful. You know, it's, it's not a huge number of people, but I, I do know that uh, there have been a number of people who have been awfully excited. And that was incorporated in the in the dust jacket as, as just a fun little bit. And it's frankly a tribute uh, to Joseph in, in, in many respects. Uh, and, and it's been fun to see people get excited about translating it. Okay. Well, look for that on the dust jacket if you're lucky enough to have a hard copy. And no, it's also on the soft cover too. Oh, it's on the soft cover too. Mm -hmm, okay. Yeah. All right. I appreciate you guys joining us today, and um, we we'll, we'll look forward to uh, maybe a follow up when uh, when your new new works come out. All right. Thank you. Thanks so much, Jason. Thanks, Jason. We want to thank you for tuning into the Whitmer Cast. John Whitmer Historical Association is an educational nonprofit institution. For more information, visit www.jwha.info, where you can meet our team and join the association, read past issues of the JWHA Journal, and get updates on upcoming conferences and events. Our theme music is I Love to Tell the Story, composed by Tom Moraine. This podcast is a production of John Whitmer Historical Association, all rights reserved.